right, today I want to talk to you about hernias. Not how to rehab them, but things you need to know about as a client and as a practitioner when you're trying to work with someone or yourself with a hernia. I'm seeing more and more people coming in with hernia problems, and they're not coming in with images. They don't even know what type of hernia they have. So first things first is you need to know what type of hernia you have. There's many types of hernia. We have hiatal, epigastric, we have spagellian. Um, we have inguinal femoral, we have inguinal scrotal. There's many types of hernias. You need to know what kind because where that window of weakness is, and that's what a hernia is, is a window of weakness, we need to know what other soft tissue, um, what other joint restrictions it can cause, and what organ systems it's going to affect. Because in every area, it's not going to only affect the tissue, it's going to affect everything in that area, but also things above in the body and things below in the body. So it's important to know what type of hernia you have. Secondly, always request an image. Doctors don't want to do images nowadays because they're not covered by insurance or they just want to be lazy and they just want to tell you you have a hernia. Well, you need to know what type and what kind because I will not work with someone unless they have images. I need to know where and what type of the hernia is so I can see what organs it's affecting and what other muscles it's affecting because typically you see people with problems above and below in the body. So images are super important. Fourth is nutrition and lifestyle. You can call us to set up your free consultation. You can go to our blog at joshrubin.wordpress.com. You can go to our website at eastwesthealing.com. Go to the resources page and the articles page. There's tons of free stuff to learn about nutrition. The bottom line is you can't make chicken salad out of chicken shit. If you're trying to rehab and repair the body, your body needs quality proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. You can't repair soft tissue issues by eating Pop-Tarts, cereal, pizza, donuts, croissants, Starbucks, and peanuts. It just doesn't work. And if you do you're never going to heal. Nutrition and lifestyle is the crutch of healing an inguinal, um, I'm sorry, healing a, uh, any type of hernia. And the bottom line is you're all what you eat. We're seeing so many people with hernia problems, they have these big guts, the organs are pushing on the soft tissue, and they're literally creating the hernias because of all the excess weight. So looking at nutrition and lifestyle, not only what they're eating, but the quality of what they're eating is super, super important. The fourth thing is respiration. Always look at the muscles of respiration, the biomechanics of respiration. When we breathe, we breathe through the belly at rest. It's diaphragmatically. Anterior, posterior movement, a lateral movement. We have an inferior, superior movement. When we breathe, that's how we breathe biomechanically. We actually have accessory muscles of inspiration and primary muscles, and we have primary muscles of inspiration and expiration. A lot of the times we see hypertonicity in the muscles or the accessory muscles of inspiration and expiration from breathing invertedly. So a lot of times these muscles will be locked up, they'll be hypertonic, causing soft tissue restrictions, causing joint restrictions, and actually facilitating the hernia. At the same time, we see people that breathe improperly because they have these big guts. What happens is they have the big gut hanging down. When they breathe, in order to get into big breath, they actually breathe with their chest. So they overuse the muscles of inspiration or the accessory muscles of inspiration and the accessory muscles of expiration. What happens is you're not going to get those normal movements of, of respiration anymore. You actually get an inferior anterior movement. So now the organs every time in a scooping motion get pushed inferior and anterior, pushing themselves into the abdominal wall, lengthening the core muscles, inhibiting it, usually leading to de degeneration in the discs in the spine and degeneration in the lumbar spine. It creates hypermobility in the lumbar spine. What typically happens is you see a hypermobility in the cervical and thoracic spine. And you see pro people with shoulder problems, TMJ problems, hearing and equilibrium problems, vision problems, and typically it's being driven from below. I'm not saying ignore those areas and ignore the outlet subluxation if you're working with a nuca chiropractor, but realize that the, the hernias are actually causing, and the faulty mechanics of respiration are causing the hernia, which is causing hypermobility in the segments above because of the hypermobility in the segments below, which is the lumbar spine. A lot of the times, too, you see these people, and I'm working one, with one right now, they typically have a diastasis in the abdominal region from faulty nutrition, faulty respiration. They have degeneration in the lumbar spine, degeneration in the discs, and they split the linea alba. And that's because of that constant inferior and anterior pushing of the organs into the soft tissue. So always assess respiration or work with someone that knows how to assess respiration. Sixth thing, always look at the ankle. If there is hypo or hypermobility issues in the subtalar joint of the ankle, you will see issues in the knee above and the pelvis above as well. And typically what you see is 
because if the ankle can't move in this plane of motion, which is a sagittal plane, it'll actually move outward into the transverse plane to compensate. And you'll typically see the pelvis drop forward. You'll typically see the, the sacrum get locked in nutation. You'll typically see it, people with chronic SI joint problems, whether it's hypermobility or hypomobility. You'll typically see lengthening of the core musculature, inhibition, um, on and on and on. So if they have an ankle problem, they can easily drive a pelvis problem and, and a hernia problem. So always look at the ankle. The other thing is with the pelvis, there's 23 axes of rotation in the pelvis, according to Guy Voyer out of Canada. So you want to work with someone that understands the pelvic um, axis is because if there's a problem in the ankle, or if they just have a hernia and there's a problem in the pelvis, well, there's certain soft tissue, there's organ systems, there's certain ligaments, there's certain veins and arteries that can easily be affected, and that's where the area of weakness is. That's where actually the hernia is coming from. So you always want to look at the entire pelvis, everything above and everything below, and not just at the hernia. Another important thing to look at when it comes to looking at a hernia is the fascia iliaca. This is based off the work of Guy Voyer. The fascia iliaca is basically the fascia in the, in the torso and pelvic region. It attaches to every organ system, veins, nerves, arteries, um, different muscular systems, the core. So if there's a, a hernia actually going through the fascia, a lot of the times it causes a torsion in the fascia, in the pelvis, because the body's always moving away from weakness. But if the fascia is being affected, it attaches to every organ system. So a lot of the times you see these people have chronic digestive problems, issues with their pancreas, issues with their adrenal glands, issues with, um, um, what do you call it, varicose veins, and on and on and on. So it's really important to get this fascia assessed, typically by a Canadian-based osteopath, and to really rehabil rehabilitate this fascia, not only with nutrition, but manual techniques. Super, super important. Another thing you want to focus on is myofascial stretching. You always want to look at muscles such as the adductors, the glutes, the obturated internus, the pectineus, um, the TFL, all the adductors, because of their correlation with the pelvis, because as well of their correlation with the um, fascia iliaca. So a lot of those muscles will be hypertonic from faulty recruitment pathways, so you need to, re you need to stretch them to bring homeostasis to the pelvis and the fascia iliaca. Another thing you want to look at is, as infants, we actually develop in the sagittal plane first, which is flexion extension like this, then frontal, which is side to side, and then transverse. Well, we develop muscle systems as we grow. Typically, people with hernias actually have transverse plane instabilities. They have compensations and torsions in their pelvis, which is like rotations above and below, like I talked about in the cervical and thoracic spine, as well as the knee and ankle joint. So you typically want to exercise these people in flexion extension movements only and then work on frontal and transverse in different phases later on. So you want to always do flexion and extension work first with these people when it comes to exercise. The last thing is always focusing on the pelvic floor. The pelvic floor is actually part of the pelvic diaphragm, which connects with the thoracic diaphragm, which connects with the cranial diaphragm. The diaphragm, how you breathe, I talked about respiration, attaches to the sternum, the last six ribs, the same ribs of the, of the TVA, which is part of the inner unit. The, the xiphoid, um, the spleen, liver, the kidney, the bladder, the colon. The colon actually transverses and goes down, goes right through the pelvic floor, so it attaches to the pelvic floor. So you always want to look at respiration like I talked about, but always look at the pelvic floor. The pelvic floor is part of the core, helps to stabilize the pelvic, pelvis, it helps with the mechanics of the SI joint. So really reestablishing the pelvic floor um, and how it works is super important when it comes to rehabilitating a hernia. A lot of the times when you see hernias, they're actually because of dysfunctions in the pelvic floor. Okay, So you're saying, well, which one do I do first? Well, if I have this, what do I do? The bottom line is I'm just giving you key things to think about if you're a practitioner or a client to, you know, if you're working with a practitioner, ask them, do they know about these things? If they don't, leave. And if you're a practitioner, if you don't know about them, start studying them. Because you can't look at the person and the hernia. You have to look at that, but also what else is it affecting on this person, and that's what's going to dictate your rehabilitation schedule. So hopefully you've learned something. This is a huge topic. I talked real fast. I'm tired. This is like my 10th time recording it because I kept going over 10 minutes, but hopefully I gave you tidbits of information that you need to know about yourself or the practitioner you're working with if you have a hernia.